Howdy, y'all. I'm Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Welcome to the Post-Invasive Airway Management Protocol Review Model. This video should be watched after completing the DSI and the RSA PRM since it comes into play following, well, invasive airway. And if you haven't watched those before, please go review them now. Now, to start with, I'd like to explain why this is the post-invasive airway protocol and not the post-advanced airway protocol. First, even in our system, supraglottic insertion is a basic skill, not an advanced one, since this protocol is to be followed after supraglottic or ETI placement, advanced just doesn't seem to fit. Next, advanced seem to, seems to imply other approaches to airway management, like BVM, is basic, and basic means easy. And while BVM ventilation certainly is at the basic level, it most assuredly isn't easy. Now, in recognition of both of these concepts, there is a national movement underway to rename advanced airway management invasive airway management. So we should be talking about non-invasive and invasive management instead of advanced and basic. That made sense to me. It was a persuasive argument, so we're going to adopt it too. Now at the basic level in this protocol, the key tasks are maintaining positioning and monitoring. RAS scores are required documentation. Now make sure the head of the bed remains elevated if you can. This allows for better physiologic function and it decreases the odds of reflux and aspiration even with an invasive airway in place. Now as always, make sure you have ongoing waveform entitl CO2 in place to confirm and monitor placement of entitled CO2. We see lots of movement of both ET tubes and supraglottics when we're reviewing entitl CO2 files after the fact. Now, our job involves lots of patient movement, and unfortunately, that often translates to lots of airway movement. Please keep an eye on that waveform entitled CO2. Now, at the advanced level, or the ALS level, I should say, make sure to continue to monitor and support circulatory status. Give fluids and or pressors, push dose or levo, to support blood pressure and refer to the circulatory support protocol for details. Now, a key point particularly important for patients who have been paralyzed is to assure ongoing sedation and analgesia. Ketamine is wonderful on so many levels, but its ability to provide both sedation and analgesia make it perfect for our uses here. To assure that we don't allow patients to suffer through awareness while paralyzed or even while having a tube in their mouth that's very uncomfortable, give a dose of ketamine as soon as you have that airway secured. Now, because the duration of action of IV or IO ketamine is about 10 to 20 minutes, we want to hit all of our patients, make sure ketamine doses are repeated every 15 minutes. Now, if you feel the patient is waking up before then, absolutely give it more frequently. Remember the goal of sedation here for patients with invasive airway is negative five. We want them fully out. Now, I recognize that in ICUs, we see lots of patients where they're trying to maintain a much lighter sedation for intubated patients. Now, at the risk of stating the obvious, we don't work in ICUs, and our patients aren't tucked nicely into ICU beds. We want them all the way out. Now, we do offer an option, dealer's choice here, option for either repeated ketamine boluses, is that boli? Or if you want, you can start a ketamine infusion. Really, it's up to you. If you opt for the infusion, start it at one milligram per minute and then titrate up as needed to a goal of a RAS of negative five. Now, the other key component in this protocol is the DOPES mnemonic. It is aimed at providing a cognitive framework for the things to think about when you're troubleshooting an airway after clinical deterioration. Now, this includes drops in blood pressure or pulse ox, and most importantly, loss of waveform in tidal CO2 or CO2 is working fine, but you're seeing evidence of breath stacking. Let's run through the DOPES mnemonic here. By the way, 
Who the hell decided how to spell mnemonic? M-N-E-U? Really? M-N? Was there something wrong with P-N-E-U? That works in other places. We like that. Do we have any linguists in the system out there who are willing to explain this to me? I mean, I would personally hate to defend this stupid spelling, but hey, at least I'll give you credit for trying. All right, rant over. Let's get back to dopes. D. D is for dislodgement. Make sure you still have good waveform in tidal CO2. And remember that no in tidal CO2 equals no airway. Fix it or pull it. For endotracheal tubes, remember you can confirm placement by going in with the laryngoscope and revisualizing. Also, try to replace the entitled CO2 tubing if that gets fouled, or just take it off and blow across the end of it. Now, for the love of all that's holy, please don't put your mouth on that thing. That's just gross. Blow across it. If you get a good waveform when you blow across it, the tube is the problem. It's not the monitor. The phrase blow to know, remember blow to know, and don't fall into this easily avoidable but lethal trap of convincing yourself that a bad tube is good. And please, please don't think that your ability to hear breath sounds in our environment is in any way reliable. It's not. you got to trust the entitled CO2. All right, that was D. O. O is for obstruction. Basically, think about boogers boogering up the tube. Suction, liberally suction is your friend. Also, make sure that you haven't kinked the tube if you crank down that tube tamer screw. P. P is for pneumothorax. Pneum, pneumo. See, PN works just fine here. Come on, linguist. Consistency, y'all? PN. I, let's take a vote. I say mnemonic needs to be spelled with a P. Anybody on board with this effort? I think it's important. Oh, pneumothorax. If you think there is a tension pneumo, Dart it. And remember, no hypotension equals no tension equals no dart. But if you think the patient's getting hypotensive, you're seeing problems with your airway, definitely dart them. Now, P can also stand for patients, as in, is the patient still pulsifying? Did they happen to go into cardiac arrest and perhaps you didn't know about it? If you had a great in title and it's slowly dropping, look at your patient. Make sure they didn't go into cardiac arrest. Make sure they haven't gotten hypotensive. And if they have, do your thing. E is for equipment. Simple things here. Is the oxygen tubing still connected to the source? Is the source empty? Is the tubing kinked? If you have a cuffed airway in place, could it have deflated? Is the endotracheal tube too small and you have a cuff leak? Remember, simple things are simple. Did someone accidentally turn off the entitled CO2 channel on the monitor? Did the entitled CO2 tubing get like unplugged, the little orange thing? Did it come out of the monitor? Is the nasal cannula entitled still plugged into the monitor instead of the inline that you assumed was plugged in? So that's, that is E for equipment. S. S is for stacking, as in breath stacking. This occurs when there is more air going out than coming in. In other words, when the inspiratory volume exceeds the expiratory volume. The classic reason for this is bronchospasm. Look to capnography for shark fins and consider inline albuterol. By the way, I don't know if you can hear me or hear this. Y'all, it is raining outside. Rain, like precipitate. I know you've forgotten what it is, but liquid falling from the sky, cooling off the melting planet. Yes, outstanding. And in case you're wondering, Astros are whooping up on the Tigers. Hate me, but we're still beating the Tigers. Where were we? Rain, Astro, breath stacking. Excessive breath stacking can lead to increased intrathoracic pressure, and that can decrease the amount of blood that is coming to the heart. In other words, increased intrathoracic pressure can decrease preload. That can be life-threatening and end up with very lethal hypotension that causes cardiac arrest. Bad. We don't want that to happen. If you suspect it, disconnect the BVM and give the patient a hug. Show them how much you care. And by give them a hug, I mean compress the chest to help them exhale and decrease that high inner thoracic pressure. 
Now, once you've done that, go ahead and start ventilating again, but you may need to allow the patient more time between breaths to adequately exhale. In other words, slow down your ventilatory rate. You also may have to do this again, and if so, go for it. Now, as a reminder of what breath stacking on capnography looks like, we've included a tracing of that at the bottom of the protocol. Guys, that is it for post-invasive airway management. As always, feel free to drop me a question or a comment. Go ahead and tell me how much you hate the Astros. Go for it. It's okay. I'm a big boy. I can take it. I really, really do. Even the Astros comments, I really enjoy hearing from y'all. Guys, thank you for what you do every day to serve our community. Take care, y'all.